Okay. Our topic today is life. It is what it is, and it's not what it's not. And therein lies our, a lot of our problems is we want life to be the way we think it should be. And as we are raised, our schools, our families, good friends, anyone who has ever given you any sort of education or training or advice or counseling, uh, they are giving you their best ideas of what life is. I'm doing it now. This is the way life is. However, not all of us is right about that. And not, and for any particular person, certainly everything that they say is not right. So we want to, we want to be discriminating in what we believe to be true about life, especially as told to us by other people in the world. The best way to discover what life is, is by experiencing it, by discovering it ourselves. Oh, this is the way it is. And until you do discover the way it is and it works, we are operating with the way it's not. And our lives are not working. Okay. So we're continuing a three-part series using the Science of Mind book. This is probably my fourth or fifth copy of the book, leather bound. Someone gave it to me as a gift with my name engraved on it in gold, they say. Yeah, is it really gold? Uh, what do I know? But it is what it is, and it's not what it's not. All right, so... Last week, we began talking about the whole kit and caboodle, this, this whole universe, the whole essence of everything, and that what, what, what this essence is, life, light, love, power, peace, beauty, joy, it's the clay, it's the stuff, we are it, we're a part of it. Um, Jeffrey mentioned, and, and, and I mentioned, that we, that we can think of the whole kit and caboodle as the ocean, and then we are a drop in that ocean or a wave on that ocean. And, but, but all that makes up an ocean is in the drop. It's in the wave. And so we're talking about this thing called life. This thing that we are experiencing. And the only reason why we're talking about it is because we experience it and we can't get away from it. So we get interested in, like, what is this? I remember decades ago, one of my, my first professional job, um, I had an office desk, and um, I worked for the Ohio legislature. And it was all done paper back then with carbon copies, if you wanted copies of stuff. They did have copy machines, but everything had to be typed out. Long time ago, folks. Typed out with a thing called a typewriter. You don't see many of them around anymore. Um, and I, uh, so that everything would be paper, paper all over the place. And I had to write memo after memo after memo. And I had my expertise. And in my office was all the paper that uh, were the facts and the statistics and the, and the writings about my expertise. And I would sit in the middle of it with paper all around me in the middle of writing a memo. And every once in a while, I would come up for a breath of air and I would look around and I would say, what am I doing here? And that was about as far as I went. I don't know. And I'd go back down into it. But every once in a while, right, we, we rise up out of this thing that we are just experiencing and we go, what am I doing? What's the point? So, Ernest Holmes tells us, um, oh, we've got, we've got some music in the room, technology. So, last week we talked about uh, this thing called life also is an infinite mind, that it, it's thinking of itself 
and it creates all that is. So in this third summary chapter here at the beginning, he says, we are surrounded by an infinite intelligence, a mind that knows all things. The divine mind is infinite. It contains all knowledge and wisdom. And he says, perhaps the simplest way to state the proposition is to say, we are surrounded by a mind or intelligence that knows everything and that the potential knowledge of all things exists in this mind. That the abstract essence of beauty, truth, and wisdom coexist in the mind of the universe. And that we exist in it. We're a part of it. So, my words. We're made up of something. My opening treatment and what uh, Jeffrey's meditation was about uh, all are a part of this. That, that this thing called life has within it a potential for becoming an infinite number of things. We know this because it's already been doing it since the beginning of the formation of this manifest universe. Infinite things have been created. And no matter how many infinite things have been created, the potential to create infinite more is still there. It didn't go anywhere. So that no matter how many things have been created in 20 billion years and, and the actual creation of the 20 billion years itself, time itself, all of that has not limited one iota of the infinite potential of what can still be created. And that is the way life is. That is what it is. It's infinite. And as we look at our own lives, it is possible for us to prove to ourselves that the way that this life is on the universal level, throw it outside in the pond. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Sit down. Get your hands. Okay. Um, <laughs> take it to get the to you. Oh, no. Okay. Um, it is possible to prove to yourself that the way that this life works on the universal level is also the way it works in me, in you. It's possible for you to prove to yourself that the infinite potential that is operating at that universal level, the way I just described that it created all this stuff for 20 billion years and it's got another 20 billion plus infinite years to go of creating stuff, that that's the way life is in the universal and that's the way it is in me. That is the way it is in you, you, you. It is possible to prove it. Now, here's the thing. You have to prove it to yourself. I could tell you that a gazillion times, right? Not off, sleep, right? Whatever. He says, we coexist in this mind of the universe. We exist in it and may draw from it. But what we draw from it, we must draw through the channel of our own minds. In other words, this infinite potential being present within each one of us only each one of us can draw from it what we will ourselves. I can't draw your life for you through me. You have to. I have to. And so if you're having an experience of, well, that's it. I'm done with my life. There's nothing new. That's it. Okay. But what you need to realize is you have decided to stop drawing from the infinite potential that's within you. That's okay. It's a choice. You could do it. We don't like that, though, in the long run. But in the short run, it sounds pretty good. But in the long run, it doesn't work because 
that life, which we've been given, we didn't ask for, right? We just, we were created. Here we are. We got this life. Now what do I do with it? Okay. But, the, but what is within this life is this urge to express more of its infinite possibility. So to stop that urge in us of expressing more is self-destructive because the life we've been given is a life that is always desiring to express more of itself, to create more forms, to do more. That idea of more is a given in the nature of life we've been given. We look at a tree and it always wants more leaves, taller, and its roots. Let me go, more roots, more, 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 more. And, and we have that urge of more flowing through us, even as human beings, even though like, you know, we're not growing more fingers or anything, um, but that urge to be more of who we are is always present in us. And so we've got to accept life is the way it is. And the way it, it is, the way that it is, is we cannot escape that urge to express more of who we are. And since we aren't just material, if I were a tree or a plant or a flower, I would be growing more taller and more, you know, accouterments and, you know, limbs and whatever. But when who we are is not material. So we're not growing more bodily parts. We've got enough. And they're always refreshing and renewing. But what we've got is this urge to be ourselves. That is who we are cannot be seen, right? But you know, you know who you are. You know this something, that uniqueness that I that I commented on with, with Jeffrey, like, you know, who knows what's going on within him, but you know, that, that like that urge to, to express verbally um, is, is dwelling within him and it comes out the way it is. And then we others outside go, wow, look at that. That's life living there, but how unique. So different from me, why? Why is it different than me? Because boy, the way I live life is, and the way Susan lives life, the way Reverend Rich lives life, right? It's, it's different. It's not the same thing. It is the same thing. What's the same thing is the urge to express who we are is the same. But the, that, that spirit that we are, it's completely different, but it is a spirit. So this is the gift of life that we have been given. It is a life that has an essence to it. We cannot see the essence of something, but it takes a form that we can recognize. Yeah, that's love. Love, we cannot see love, right? You know, but you know, when you got that little dog coming up to you, wagging its tail, whatever, that's love. And when you, um, when you, when you look into the eyes of, of some good friend, that connection, it's love, right? So we can't see the essence of something. This something that is life, this gift, what life is, is it cannot be seen for what it is, but it is what it is. And what we are always doing is expressing what we believe this life is. And sometimes, or a lot, we are expressing what this life is not. And that's where we get into trouble. So he has another little part of these, these beginning things, which every student of the science of mind gets pointed to. Page 43, love rules through law. And, you know, everybody's got to, like, think of that. Because we talk about this thing called life is something that is love and something that is law. And we need to understand this in order to know what this life is. So he says, we have come to understand that all is love 
and yet all is law. What does that mean? Love rules through law. Love is the divine givingness. Law is the way. Blah, 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 blah. So, love is the essence, that invisible stuff from which physical matter is made. But it's more than physical matter. Love is that emotion of feeling the, the divine urge to give of oneself. Love is what motivated Susan to share what she shared and Jeffrey to share and Reverend Rich to sing and what I'm saying right now. It's the universal love more and more of it comes out of us. And so we are an outlet for what is invisible within us. And we know, we feel when we are expressing the essence of who we are and we're not happy when we are not expressing the essence of who we are for whatever good reason we have. So this essence of love that we are, we get to express as much of that love as we are willing to express. That's the way it is. But if we're not willing to ex or desiring or, or able to express this love, we don't. And so we don't experience the love that we are. We don't get to experience the love that we are, the intelligence that we are. about the essence of us. It's infinite potential. There's an infinite capacity within us to express this love, an infinite variety, in infinite ways, you know, with this pedestal, with the microphone, with the book, with you, with my own self, infinite ways to express it. But I only get to experience the amount of love that I allow myself to express. We must be an outlet of this stuff that we are. Oh, this is genius. Okay. I can see all the thinking going on in the room. All right. So let me take the example of power. Infinite power is what life is. Universal life is power. Look at it. The Big Bang. That power being invisible but it did something, the Big Bang, which was visible. That's power. Now you can't, like, like what is power? It, what is love? What is life? What is beauty? What is it, right? They're invisible essences of who we are, but it expresses. And so power is omnipresent and it uses laws for it to express. So in the example of power, electricity is a law, the law of electricity. Again, you cannot see laws. So you can't see the essence of who we are and you can't see the laws through which the essence creates and expresses, but we can see the results, which is the lights overhead. There are lights above me. There is the internet, my laptop moving thing. There is the microphone broadcasting noise. It is all the essence of power using electricity, the law of electricity to be sound and sight and light and, you know, and it takes form. When we think of power, there's another law of gravity. Another law of co the quantum forces that we have an atom so that things which are infinite and invisible can be somehow drawn together to take a form that is visible through these laws of quantum binding. I didn't have time to look up all the physical words for these different laws, but gravity holding, holding us onto this planet. It is the essence of power working through a law that produces 
something we can see on here on the planet, something that we can experience, something that we can point to, something that I, I can point to that little dog and go, that is love. I can point at the flower and say, that is beauty. But it's beauty operating through a law. Why? Because I see this flower. It's beauty. And so the science of mind, right? We're trying to understand this thing called life. And so the way it works is the way it works. We're trying to figure out what it is. So, right? So next week we could talk about how to use it, right? So if I am this infinite possibility, if I am life, light, love, power, peace, beauty, harmony, joy, and that there's laws through which that there are laws that I can use to express that which I am, these qualities, in some sort of output. Well, if that's who I am, and if that's what life is, then, whoa. If I'm all love, all beauty, all joy, what am I doing with it? Right? How... And so that's the key to this teaching. Ernest Holmes says, oh, go back to the original thing. The thing itself, the way it serves, what it does. We must draw from it through the channel of our own minds. He says, our thought and emotion is the use we make, consciously or unconsciously, of this original creative thing. And the biggie. This thing, then, works through us and is us always. But it spreads itself over the whole universe and shouts at us from every angle, but it can only become the good to us when we recognize it. Or he says, it can only become power to us when we recognize it as power. This thing called life can only become love to us when we recognize it as love. It can only can become peace to us when we, we recognize its peace. It doesn't become peace to us when the whole rest of the world discovers peace and becomes peaceful. That is not going to be your experience of peace. That is not how you or I get peace by everybody else on the planet being peace and expressing peace. The way each one of us gets peace is by our own decision to become an outlet for that peace, by making that decision to be peace. That is the only way I'm going to get peace. It's the only way you're going to get peace. You don't have to worry about whether anyone else is getting peace or not because you're not going to get your peace any other from any other place than that infinite potential within you. And the way that we get it is by expressing it. And the, how do you express it? Boy, this is where it gets really cool because I want to be more love. It's using this thing called life, right? This thing called life with its urge for more and saying more, we get to choose more what? We get to choose the what? More what? More love, more beauty, more joy, more peace, whatever. Okay, it's all, I want it all. All right then. But it can only become more power to us or more peace to us or more intelligence to us when we name it. When we say, I want to be more pick love. Well, I want to be more of that infinite potential of love within me. I wanted to express it more. Now, containing in this infinite potential, thank God, is the next new way that we can experience love. We don't have to come up with that. How, well, what should I do? I want to be more love. So I need to, we don't know. How can we know? Infinite potential is unknown to us our thinking mind until we experience it. We only know what we experience. And so 
the infinite potential of love or the good that is yet to be exists there. And then what we can do is call on it to move through us in a greater way. And it gives us ideas and it gives, and it brings experiences to us and it rearranges our, our worlds so that we stumble onto it. I remember years ago, I was in a, uh, uh, a one act play called Chamber Music. And it was the story of uh, a group of women, I guess there were a dozen of us in an insane asylum. And each one of us believed we were some famous person, a different famous person. And I played Joan of Arc. I believed I was Joan of Arc. And so I carried around with me this giant cross that I would be burned at the, at the stake with, but I would whack people with it, you know, when, if the opportunity was required. The director was brilliant. She was bringing creativity through her. Uh, I don't know what her religious beliefs are and her spiritual awareness was. Back then, I was clueless, so I knew nothing. But the thing is, is that something in her, and that's what Ernest Holmes points out, is you don't have to be particularly spiritual to bring more of the infinite potential through you in the way you choose. And so she chose creativity. And what she decided to do in this wonderful little play was use music stands for the 12 of us to stand behind when we were holding our meetings, chamber music. We each had a little music stand and we each were speaking our own famous person voice and screaming and yelling and, you know, cause we were all crazy. But the thing is, is that it was a beautifully orchestrated piece of genius that moved through her and I, at the time, I thought, I don't think anyone else gets how brilliant this is. No big deal made out of it. It was just there. But it said everything about this play. Everything. So we have someone like Albert Einstein who wants to discover the, the laws of the physical universe. And it just kept... He, had inf he knew the infinite potential of intelligence and, and, and the infinite possibility of gaining more and more knowledge about the way this universe physically is operating. He knew that was always present in him. And so he continued to discover more and more of the nature of life, through his life throughout his lifetime. And it never stopped for him because he knew that there was always more, more, more. Right? And so whatever you choose, I, you know, I read that book called Peak, and they're talking about the development of expertise, being an expert at something. And in looking at the people who have developed that top achievement of something, know that there's an infinite potential for more. And why do they know it? Because they've proved it to themselves already. They know, they already know that they began as someone who could not stand on a pair of ice skates. That's how the, the best Olympic winning skaters of all time began, being completely unable to stand on a pair of ice skates. They might have been two. They were unable to stand. But they proved to themselves that there was a skater that could emerge. And it kept proving, they kept proving that to themselves, achievement after achievement. And look at us. You look at Sonia Henny, Henny, right? One turn. And she won the Olympics, right? One, I just did it there. Equal to the, the expertise of skating as Sonia. And now, four turns is becoming normal. What is wrong with people? <laughs> they know what life is. So the thing is, is that we may know what life is wherever we contact it and experience it 
and then we know what this life is. And wherever we have not contacted it and experienced it, we don't know what it is. And so we want to get, we want to realize that there is omnipresence and infinite potential always. And then in that little spot where we are is all this potential. And it needs an outlet. It's us. And we get to choose the what. What. What aspect of the essence of our nature are we going to draw out next? And we can hop around. Okay. I speak Italian. And I dance ballet. And <laughs> I'm a cat owner. And I'm a knitter. And... Um, I'm a writer, more and more and more of each. But I could also, or you could also choose that one thing, that one aspect. I am going to take this year and know something more about beauty, that essence of beauty that is potential within me than ever before. Last year, I picked... Uh, what did, I forget, it'll come to me. Two years ago, I know, I picked ease. And every day, more ease, more ease in living, more ease in living. I learned a lot, a lot changed. And so whatever quality it is that you choose, you could choose just one, or you could go around. I have a really good ministerial friend who every month she picks a different quality of the divine to express more of. It's when you have infinite potential to work with, you have to choose something. Because if you don't choose something, you get nothing. The infinite potential in each of us can lie dormant until we choose some aspect to draw through us to become an outlet for it. And that's the way life is. And Ernest Holmes says, we cannot receive the good that we desire to receive while we are thinking it is not. So let's uh, take a moment now and contemplate what we want to draw through us. It's all there more intelligence, more creativity, more love, or more engineering knowledge, more Italian knowledge. We could be, you know, it's infinite. Pick the grandest, the grandest, the teeniest, the teeniest. It's only your life that is cares. It's only you that cares about what you choose. Nobody else does. They're busy with their own business of living, right? It's your life. What are you making of it? So think of that while we do this, while Reverend Rich sings the song. And when we come back, I'll do a spiritual mind treatment to direct the law, to let more of it come through you, whatever you choose. Mm -hmm. 